Welcome to tonight's London Luminaries Lectures, 12 historic organisations working collaboratively together to celebrate our collective heritage. My name is Rachel Morrison and I'm from Marble Hill and I'll be your host for this evening. So it's with great delight that I get the opportunity to welcome our chair for this evening. She is a professor of literature. She's a trustee of Pope Scrotto Preservation Trust and she's an eminent broadcaster. It's Professor Judith Hawley. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you to those of you behind the scenes who've made this series possible. And thank you to our audience, many of whom are, are loyal uh, watchers of these, this series live. It's lovely to have you here in person and also particularly enjoyable to join into the, in the Q&A with you afterwards. But it's also very nice to know that there are people watching us later on YouTube in the in the captioned version. If you're watching this as part of the series, you'll see that connections are building up over the course of our series. This particular group of lectures is on poets, painters, patrons and politicians. But we also had a, 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 um, a lecture on the garden of Hogarth's house earlier. So if you're if you're interested in that, do go back and watch that on YouTube. I'm delighted to introduce this talk today on William Hogarth, uh, one of the well-known painters in our neighbourhood and our lovely part of West London. And our speaker tonight is very well placed to talk to you about him. Our speaker is John Collins, who is Historic Houses Senior Manager for the London Borough of Hounslow. Since 2011, he's been responsible for the care and operations at Hogarth's house. John is particularly interested in Hogarth's legacy and his influence on art and society, an interest most recently realized with an exhibition of Dame Paula Rego's work at Hogarth's house. And his lecture tonight is intriguingly titled, Hogarth versus everyone. Over to you, John. Many of you may know Hogarth as the often called father of English painting, as an engraver, as a satirist, uh, and as a printmaker. And I'm speaking as uh, someone working um, at Hogarth's house, uh, a little more on that later, but Hogarth's house has a great collection of Hogarth's prints. And I think it's important to just establish a bit of background about Hogarth and that aspect of its work, because it's the prism through which we're going to look at a lot of what Hogarth uh, ran into as controversies in his life. There's a huge menu uh, of controversies to select from Hogarth, but I've picked ones through which we can convey that story through his work and most notably his prints. Um, I think it's important to say that Hogarth was an artist of many talents. He was somebody who would take commissions from individuals, from institutions. He was a very fine painter, but he also engraved copper printing plates and ran limited editions of various sizes of print runs from those and that was a big part of his business and a big part of his success. It's important to talk about the printing process because it's a very agile one and it's one that allows him to do a lot of things uh, for good or bad throughout his career and just to give that background of that process you see on the left here Hogarth's self-portrait uh, from 1745 uh, the painting version. To the right is an engraved version of Hogarth's self-portrait and what Hogarth is essentially doing is creating onto that copper plate a series of lines of different lengths, widths and depths which then are printed, which are printed from and they always appear in the mirror image as you can see here. So that's the man himself and that's a bit of the process about him. Um, but as I say I'm talking from Hogarth's house and we're going to be talking about Hogarth and his home a few times through the course of this. So it's important to establish that Hogarth had two houses. What you're seeing here is the on the left, Hogarth's uh, view of his house from Chiswick. This one was a republication after his death uh, issued by Jane Hogarth. But Hogarth buys this house, the Hogarth's house that's open to the public now that you can come see as a historic house and museum to his work. Um, this house is not one that Hogarth built, it's built in, uh, well, it's completed by 1717-18, um, and Hogarth purchases it in 1749. Um, what we're going to talk about a lot of the time, though, is Hogarth's other house. Um, 
And that is the house that he has in Leicester Square. Uh, at the time, that was Leicester Fields. Uh, this is a later uh, image after Hogarth's uh, death, was public, public, published after Hogarth's death at Big Garden. Uh, if you're looking for this to be a guide to find Hogarth's former home, uh, it is now roughly consumed by what is the Odeon Cinema. Uh, so orientation-wise, the square is still there, um, but Hogarth would have known Leicester Fields and a house from which he also uh, had a studio, a studio where he would produce works and advertise those works for sale. And we're back to that interplay now between the painting and the print. Hogarth often produces a painting first, and it's those series of paintings which are often on display here in London. The prints are advertised from the display, so you would go see the paintings and order a subscription to the prints at a much lower price. That process of printmaking is one that Hogarth um, is active in throughout his life. And very few of the copper plates actually survive. This is one that's on display in Hogarth's house from an extremely early series that he produces, uh, Hudebra. And you can just see the amount of detail that's gone into marks into metal onto which ink would be placed rubbed in, rubbed down again, and that impression of the ink that would fill the spaces that he makes to produce the prints, some of which we'll see as we go on today. Now, Hogarth, his printmaking often is the way in which he comes into conflict with people. So the title of this talk is Hogarth versus Everybody, and we're gonna do a whistle stop tour of four instances throughout Hogarth's life uh, where he comes into conflict with movements, people, uh, things about society. But that printmaking um, is one of the first sources of Hogarth going up against a section of society. And to give a bit of background about how that printmaking works, Hogarth has established himself by the early 1730s. He's producing uh, works that are popular and are garnering interest. And to give a little bit of context to that, this is a print of Sarah Malcolm. Um, now, Sarah Malcolm was a murderer um, who in February 1733, she strangled an 80 year old wid widow and cut the throat of that widow's 17 year old maid. She maintained her innocence all the way through. She did everything from blaming three other people for it uh, she scandalised the court during the trial by saying loudly that the bloody shift that was presented as evidence of her committing the deed was in fact not blood from a murder, but from menstruation, which for the 1730s is something which is drawing even more attention from this young woman who has killed uh, two people. She is convicted of that murder and sentenced to execution, but two days before that, Hogarth goes to visit her and he goes to make sketches. Those sketches do two things. The first is to produce a portrait and the other is to produce a series of prints. And I think what's interesting to note here as the background is he's producing prints that the day after she is executed, an advert appears in the press saying that in just two days time, the prints will be available to buy. Printmaking is really important to Hogarth. It's the thing which can consistently generate him an income and it allows him to tap into the sort of popular culture of London to produce things that people are interested in having there and then. That's reflected in the fact that Hogarth starts, he's most famous for his series, um, often called the Modern Moral Series. Uh, this, A Harlot's Progress, produced in 1732. It's focused on the fictional, um, the life of the fictional prostitute Mole Hackabout. Um, it's a process of six paintings that are completed in 1732. And at that point, the engravings are advertised. You can buy a subscription, they're released gradually. 1,200 sets were sold. And what Hogarth's doing particularly here is putting in real and identifiable locations within London but also real life characters in the background of prints and events that have recently taken place in the newspaper. This brings him into a conflict with piracy. 
effectively people copy his prints and this is something which Hogarth decides not to take laying down. We move on to a rake's progress uh, produced in 1735. Now Hogarth holds back on producing this. Um, subscribers might have expected to see prints of the rakes as early as 1733, but he's formed a plan and that plan is based on uh, what happens for authors in 1709 when they receive uh, Act of Parliament which gives copyright to authors. Hogarth seeks the same now for printmakers. He writes an open letter to Parliament called The Case for Designers, Engravers and Etchers. He talks about the miserable prices that he um, gets paid for his work and the overgrown shopkeepers who refuse to pay and then fuel the market, the black market of copies. By the end of 1734, his united people who are in his circle but may not necessarily be uh, friends or in fact rival printmakers to petition Parliament and an engraving copyright act of 1734 gets royal assent in June 1735 at exactly the moment Hogarth then releases the series of prints. It doesn't actually help. Um, Hogarth goes to war with uh, the pirates and gets the law changed, but already pirate uh, makers of prints are at his studios. They're spying up, um, looking at a rake's progress and before Hogarth gets his prints out, there are already adverts from major printmakers talking about the adventures of Randall Gripe, who at that point was supposed to be the main character. Hogarth quickly renames and reworks the paintings, and all of a sudden we don't have Randall Gripe. We have Raquel as the main uh, protagonist. He even goes into paintings themselves and overpaints them, something which if you're able to get to the Tate's exhibition on Hogarth in Europe, you'll be able to see the x-rays that prove that Hogarth overpainted them. Uh, it wasn't fully the victory Hogarth uh, would have hoped for because he didn't quite consider what happened if your image was engraved by somebody else. And when the um, act was tested in 1753, it did have a few loopholes, but it was the foundation of copyright for artists. Hogarth moves on to societal issues as something which um, brings him into conflict with society next. Um, what we're looking at here are perhaps his most famous works of Beer Street and Gin Lane. Um, they were produced in 1751, and these are campaigning pieces. They're one of the rare sets of prints that Hogarth issues that he issues without uh, a painting. And part of that is they're part of a movement. They're trying to battle the gin craze, which has been raging for nearly 50 years at this point, from the um, around 1689, when the government, for all sorts of reason, propping up the grain price, trying to increase trade. Uh, they decided that uh, the fermentation of uh, grain would be a, a good thing to do. And so gin is everywhere. They even stopped the imports of wine and spirits from France to encourage the industry at home. Uh, there are a lot of unintended consequences, and those consequences are the ones that you see on the right of this image, where society is going to pot. Um, all classes of society are affected by this. The buildings are in disrepair. The only business that thrives um, in Gin Lane, which is the image on the right here, is the pawnbrokers, as you see people selling the tools of their trade. Uh, and the only house that's upright is that of the pawnbroker. He extols the virtues of beer. Um, and in doing so, you see the reverse on the image on the left, where the only building that's in disrepair when you drink beer is the pawnbrokers. But this is part of a movement. So Hogarth's uh, friend, Henry Fielding, has recently published an inquiry into the late um, increase in robberies. He blames gin. Um, and gin was dangerous. There was no quality control. It was often mixed with dangerous substances like turpentine. A 1736 act had been roundly exploited. And by the 1640s, we were pretty much back to where we started. We got to the point where the parish of St Giles, where um, Gin Lane is depicting, by 1750, over a quarter of the residences in St Giles uh, parish were gin, would sell gin. Hogarth advertised the issue of these works in the uh, London Evening Post in 1751. They were ready a week later, uh, one shilling each. 
Uh, they were advertised um, with a note uh, so that uh, people should note well, as the subjects of these prints are calculated to reform some reigning vices peculiar to the lower class of people in the hopes of rendering them more extensive use, the author has published them in the cheapest manner possible. These are sold cheaply um, with Hogarth's argument so that the poor can learn the lesson he's trying to teach them. Now, a shilling is still way beyond the reaches of the poor, but he does both undercut people who are trying to copy his works and reach a wider audience he might not have stretched before. Um, it's interesting that Hogarth is going up against both a movement and some may say the working classes. He also goes to bat for his friends. This is um, John Joshua Kirby. Um, he was a friend of Hogarth, an artist, a friend of Gainsborough, um, and later a clerk of the works at the Royal Family at Kew. Um, he produces a book on linear perspective and Hogarth produces the frontispiece for this work. So you see on the left, this is Hogarth's satire on false perspective. Hogarth notes that whomever makes a design without the knowledge of perspective will be liable to such absurdities as are shown in this frontispiece. And you can see the tower on the uh, right where a candle is uh, serving to light a pipe of somebody on a hill. It should be the background. And all across the painting, there are, all across the print rather, there are mistakes of perspective. This leads to conflict. Um, and to the right, the image you see here is the Hogarth Kirby letter. Kirby receives some criticism for his work uh, from artists such as uh, John Highmore, and they come into conflict over the idea that you can't simply apply mathematical rules, is what Kirby is saying. You have to stretch your eye as well. And this is something which causes conflict in the art world. And he writes a letter to Hogarth. The letter you see on the right is something that's part of the Hogarth House collection. Um, where Kirby sends Hogarth his 21 page reply to the criticism and Hogarth advises him that he is in fact right um, and Kirby comes away and goes back to comment I cannot be convinced to the contrary unless it can be proven that the eye in seeing objects conforms strictly to mathematical principles and that the judgment is not acquired by custom or experience. Hogarth writes a lot in art theory and his support for Kirby against the portion of the art world that uh, holds different views is quite strong. We come on now to the final conflict we'll be talking about, and this is towards the end of Hogarth's life. Um, it's one of the last conflicts he runs into. This is a plate called The Times. Um, produced in 1763. And it's really the only plate where Hogarth ever goes overtly political. Um, in this very complex uh, picture, which shows a scene of fire, um, chaos, things falling apart. Uh, this is a political attack on um, the side of the political uh, spectrum from which Hogarth disagrees. So he supports uh, the prime minister, and the, what's depicted here are the effects of the faction which sits against the prime minister, um, who he sees as ruining. So um, you have, um, the, we have Lord Newcastle, uh, the pub which is falling apart is Newcastle. Um, what's happening here though is that Hogarth comes into conflict with two particular people who take the opposite political stance from him. Those are the journalist Charles Churchill, and the politician MP John Wilkes, both of whom are intimately involved with a paper called the North Britain. And this becomes a very publicly played out spat between the two that takes place, a spat that takes place through art and literature. Um, Wilkes comments on this, although Wilkes comments, sorry, that Hogarth has begun his attack today. I shall attack him in hobbling prose, you, I hope, in smooth paced verse. And uh, he's writing there to Churchill as they plan how they will respond to this. Hogarth, for his part, said that neither are depicted, neither Churchill nor Wilkes are depicted here, but he is attacking the political standpoint with which they're most aligned. And Wilkes, pictured here by Hogarth, um, was quite scaling, as both of them were. He talks about Hogarth's insufferable vanity. 
He talks about his envy, his rancor, his malevolence. He attacks Hogarth's family throughout. And it's, it's a relentless point at which Hogarth is actually intermittently unwell um, in the year leading up to his death that this is taking place in. Um, he is, John Wilkes is shown here a uh, year after all of this argument kicks off. Um, he's, this is Hogarth's revenge through art. So he shows Wilkes, you see his wig there, uh, slicked back almost into horns. Uh, his smile has become a sneer. Wilkes was a famously ugly person, uh, according to all the literature at the time. And Hogarth really hands that up here. But he was also somebody who was lauded by large portions of society as a supporter of liberty. And you see the hat of liberty uh, over his head, but he's holding it on his staff as if he's playing with it. The Hogarth suggestion, quite possibly that, that twirling on that pole, um, he's using liberty to seduce people who he could then exploit. Uh, Charles Churchill um, goes after him in Poet, so he goes after the verse, uh, and it's a quite vicious program, uh, poem called An Epistle to William Hogarth. He is, he spares um, no criticism, it's um, a poetic version of what Wilkes writes, and Hogarth responds to him. He produces uh, the image on the right, called the Bruiser, uh, which is representing Charles Churchill, but the vehemency with which Hogarth does this, he makes Churchill out to be a drunken um, bear. He has a he carries with him a club there, a satire that's covered in lies and the words. And in this work, the self-portrait of which it's based of Hogarth to the left, Hogarth effectively becomes his pug. And the pug on the right in the bruiser image is standing on Churchill's poem and uh, doing his business there to show what he thinks of it. Hogarth goes in, takes his own self-portrait engraving, reworks the plate, effectively rubs the plate clean and it re-engraves on it. And he does this a couple of times and the state that you see on the right is the final version. To the bottom right of that bruiser image, Hogarth's conflict and some might say rank or agreeing with Wilkes to a degree is he puts an engraving in the engraving and in that, Hogarth is whipping a bear to symbolise um, the bruiser, Charles Churchill, and a monkey to signify Wilkes. The Hogarth went after a great many people um, in his time, and they went after him in return. But to see a public spat played out through art, verse, and prose is uh, perhaps a fitting crescendo for Hogarth, who would die shortly after this um, in 1764. And that is... The end of this talk. Um, if anyone is interested in volunteering, um, not just for Hogarth's House, but for um, anywhere in West London, there is a volunteer fair at Hogarth's House on the 9th of March uh, from 1 pm to 4 pm. There will be 17 organisations represented there and a chance to see what you can volunteer at, at heritage sites throughout West London, including many of the people who are involved in this series and a reminder of that series here. Thank you so much, John, for that, that amazing talk. Um, you, you gave us an insight into some of the things that, that animated Hogarth, which were absolutely at the centre of 18th century life, moral life and politics during the period. All of these talks in this series and our previous series are available on YouTube.